We're going to continue in Revelation 17 today, but we're going to look into the honor of God as we look at this. Revelation 17 is a, an amazing, uh, a lot of roads converge in Revelation 17 as far as being able to uh, collectively understand what's happening. And in the context of John 1, 5, I think Revelation 17 is really an example of that. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And in order for the world to get to Revelation 17, there's got, a, there's got to be a lot of embracing of darkness or uh, choosing darkness over light in order for the world to get to Revelation 17. And it seems to me, and I could be totally wrong, but it seems to me that most of the world is headed that way in a very big hurry right now. There are some amazing things that have already happened in the world as far as religion and politics coming together and sponsoring each other. And it's going to intensify more and more as we move towards the uh, time of trouble and the second coming of Jesus. There have been some huge gatherings at the United Nations this year. All the religious leaders are the main religious leaders of the world. And the, and the top religious leaders of the world of different religions came together at the United Nations. It was led, orchestrated by the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. And then this happened again over in Asia. And they had another big convocation where all these religious leaders and political leaders of that part of the world and different people joined together again. And this is happening on a regular basis. And they're not just getting together and singing kumbaya. They're getting together and planning a strategy to save the world and to control the world because that's the way they believe the only way the world can be saved is if they're in charge. And that's a very serious situation that's already happening. In October, the Roman Catholic Church and most of the Lutheran Church is uniting together and other Protestants, and they're coming together to say things like, we apologize for the Reformation. It should have never happened. That's wild. So you, I believe we're going to see a lot of Protestants starting to distance themselves from some of these maneuvers. In fact, I've already seen quite a few. I know some in my own family who are very alarmed about it from the Lutheran background, and they, they are not going along with it, and I praise God for that. But as we look at Revelation, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, of course, this is after Revelation 16, where John has just seen the, the, the vials poured out and the judgments of God without mercy and now that one of the angels who had one of the seven vials is going to come and, and connect a lot of the dots. He's going to go back and he's going to look at a lot of things that have happened before the seven vials. Because we know that at the end of the seven vials, Jesus comes. So this is not continuing after the seven vials. This is going back before the seven vials and looking and seeing what the enemy is going to be doing. And what the deceived human race is going to be doing. And he says, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Mystery Babylon, mystic Babylon, the great harlot. Now, a harlot is an old word, an ancient, an older word for, for prostitute. A prostitute who sells, is someone who sells their dignity, their honor, and their integrity for money, to survive, to get along. And that is basically what every human being who does not receive Jesus Christ and the seal of God is going to do during the time of trouble. They're going to sell out just to be able to eat or to be able to have a job or to be able to have a house over their head, to be able to buy or sell. They're going to prostitute themselves spiritually so they can get along and not suffer. Now, in itself, it's not a bad thing that people don't want to suffer. 
I think that's a healthy outlook that you'd, if you had the choice, now do I want to suffer for 60 years, my whole life, 70, 80 years, or do I want to live healthy and happy? And, and most of us in our teenage years would say, yeah, we want to be happy when we're 80. We don't want to be suffering. But most of us have not been able to hold up on that. When you're young, you're invincible. You'll never lose your teeth. You'll never have creaky, snappy, poppy knees. You'll always be able to climb a tree. It's just, you know, why not? Let's just eat whatever we want and drink whatever we want. And if we don't sleep half the time when we're supposed to be asleep, we'll still be strong. You know, we'll be able to handle it. Well, that, that catches up with you somewhere around 40 or 50 or 60, and it catches up in a big way, doesn't it? <laughs> so praise God for the health ministry that God has sent through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I know a lot of 80s and 90s and even people into their hundreds that still get up. And I, I've met a guy 100 years old still driving. It was a lady. That is amazing. Seventh-day Adventists can do some amazing things when they're in their 80s and 90s. So, but this harlot is a, a spiritual representation of what happens when you sell your soul to the devil. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, understand this. This is talking about the time of trouble. This is talking about when this system called Babylon is ruling the entire earth. Now, we've seen some very large fulfillments and applications of this down through the centuries of time, but we've never seen it worldwide the way Mystery Babylon is going to set it up. And it's going to be in a conglomerate, and they're going to do it. And all the kings, the rulers, the political, civil leaders of the world will jump into bed spiritually with mystery Babylon. And it's a guaranteed fact. And as we see the things happening in the, in the governments and in the nations of the earth, as we see compromise occurring, as we see perversion and decadence ruling in the laws and the legislations and these policies that are being implemented, as we see these things spreading around the earth, it should be a serious alarm in our hearts and minds to say something really bad is happening. In fact, I believe that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 is what is happening on a very, it's been happening for a while, but it's starting to speed up as far as I can tell. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They were happy and hopeful and thinking this party will never end and we're going to be just fine. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the same beast of Revelation 13. And we are seeing this beast morph and become a little more connected politically and religiously to where the world will be controlled by this. Now, there's much more here, but we're only going to go, this is introductory, and we're only going to go through it that way. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Purple is the clothing of kings. Scarlet, the clothing of religious leaders, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Wealth, taxing of the people. Anytime you see a people being taxed to, to slavery, basically, then you will see the governments living in opulence and in wealth and extravagance. And it's amazing what's been happening. Don't have time to go into it, but the devil likes to try to make people think that there is a monetary, a, a financial reward, and a better off than I was before type of reward if you follow his lead. But it just gets more vile and abominable. Now, and on her name was written, 
mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, I have to share with you that this has been going on long before the Roman Catholic Church ever existed. This was going on in Egypt. This was going on in ancient Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and all those other cronies of his. It's been going on ever since Cain decided he was going to start his own religion. And he set up a worship system that was 180 degrees against the God of heaven. And it's been promoting over the earth for all those years. But it has not culminated. It will culminate and climax during the time of trouble. And I do believe that the largest religious group on earth, the most wealthy institution on earth, as far as I can tell, will lead the charge on this right out of Rome. And, but all the other religions will be brought into this pot, this melting pot, and it's not a big deal to hold on to some of your own unique beliefs if you're a Hindu or if you're a, a Buddhist or if you're a Muslim or if you're anything else. Even an atheist now can be welcomed into this conglomerate beast because the, the leader of the religious world, declared by many of the religious leaders, has declared that God will even accepts atheists to come into heaven. And it's an interesting thing. The gospel says that if you deny Jesus Christ, you'll be denied before the Father. Yet this, quote, Christian leader is telling people that you don't have to believe in Jesus to get to heaven. Does that sound like someone's trying to make friends of all the religions on earth? Well, you know, I, I don't mind making friends with people. But I don't believe I should be making friends at the expense of Jesus Christ. I don't believe I should set him over here somewhere in his own little corner and let Buddha have his corner and let 3,000 of the Hindu gods have their corners and let Muhammad or whoever have his corner. I don't believe in doing that. Jesus Christ stands alone. That's something that I, I became aware of, very acutely aware of, one day in July, the, on July 3rd, 1975, the Lord let me know in no uncertain terms, there's no other way in. Now, I wish there were other ways in. And I'm sure God, if he could have done it any other way, he would have said, okay, Jesus, we'll do it this other way. You don't have to go to the cross. But he didn't do that that night. Jesus prayed, is there any other way? Basically what he said, is this the only way? To save people? Is this, am I the only one who can do this? And the father said, yeah, you're the only one. This is the only way. And we need to be able to share that in a way that the Holy Spirit can bless our witness so that people won't think we're egomaniacs. Because usually it's an egomaniac who thinks that their religion is the only one going to heaven. Really, usually that's what it is, right? I, I, I went to the Church of Christ for about four years off and on with my buddies. My, my, we were in sports together, and so guys like to hang out. I'd go to church with them. Lutheran Church didn't have meetings on Wednesday night, so I went with my buddies on Wednesday night. And, and Lutheran Church didn't have meetings on Sunday evening either. They just had Sunday morning meetings. They figured that was enough for the whole week. And so I would go with my buddies on Sunday night to the Church of Christ. And, and, and you know, you go to these churches, and you go with your buddies, and then you start meeting girls, right? You start meeting girls. And so I, I stopped sitting with my buddies, and I started sitting with some, some you know, one girl in particular, and then, and then another girl in particular. And the strange thing, that they both went to the same church, and they were next-door neighbors, and it wasn't my fault. And so... I would just sit with one or the other one, and I felt kind of bad about that, but what do you do, you know? When you're not a Christian, you don't know what you're doing, right? <sighs> Finally, one day, I had an interview with the Church of Christ pastor. He wanted me to become a Church of Christ member. Now, I don't say this. I'm just telling you how real this is, at least back there. It's a, it still is that way. He literally sat there and told me, unless you are baptized by a Church of Christ pastor 
And unless you take communion from a Church of Christ pastor every Sunday, you will not get into heaven. That's what he told me. Charlie said that's what they told him too. Out here on the West Coast, they told you that. Oh, that was Tennessee. See, that's closer to Oklahoma. So uh, I looked him in the eyes. I said, well, brother, you just keep believing in Jesus, and I will see you there someday. Adios. Because you don't want to join some group that think they're the only ones going to heaven. Right? Seventh, there's still a few Seventh-day Adventists around like that, but they're getting fewer and fewer. And the ones that are getting, are still believing that think that we're crazy because we think other Christians are going to heaven. Well, uh, it was an interesting time for me. But I learned a lot from the Church of Christ. I learned a lot about Jesus. Good things. I learned a lot of true things about Jesus from the Church of Christ. And I learned a lot of true things about Jesus from the Baptists. And I learned a lot of true things about Jesus from the Lutherans. And I even learned some things about Jesus from some Roman Catholics. And I tell you what, when you get to the place where you can't learn from other people, you've become a know-it-all. And you'll never learn much anymore. And I don't want to get there. I want to be able to learn even from a duck-billed platypus, you know. I mean, there ought to be something we can learn from watching a little duck-billed platypus, Right? We need to let God talk to us. But this critter here, this monster here, has committed the unpardonable sin. They have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and they've not only received the mark of the beast when this happens. This hasn't happened yet. It will happen during the time of trouble. They will receive the mark of the beast, and they will force it on others who do not have Christ in their lives. The only one who can stand between you and the mark of the beast is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can protect you from that and cover your, your soul 